Hello, everybody. Vitaimo, dobri den, dobri ranok, depending where you are on the globe. Um, welcome to our Fulbright discussion today. We have a really exciting panel ahead of us. Um, our topic today is how war shapes Ukrainian art and decoloniality. We are going to have um, about you know 15 minutes, 20 minutes each presentation. We've got four speakers today, and we'll save our Q and A for the end. But you're welcome to put your questions into the chat or you know send uh, links to each other. What what you you know think might be relevant to today's discussion. Um, also wanted to mention all of our Fulbright Ukraine programs are up and running. We have a new cycle of applications. Our uh, scholar application deadline is in October. So those of you who might be thinking of applying or um, know somebody who is interested, spread the word. This year, we are accepting applications from Ukrainian citizens who are displaced due to the war. So if you're not living in Ukraine, you could still apply uh, through our office. Um, we also have now launched a new scholarship program through IIE at our office um, with exciting co-chairs um, in, in the area of democracy and democracy building. So go to our webpage, read about it. We've got things going on um, to look forward to despite the dark times that we're all living through right now. Um, today's speakers are all Fulbright alumni, and they are doing fabulous things, each of them, in the sphere of visual culture, communication, writing, um, teaching. Many of you in the audience, I recognize some names, also share these interests, so we're looking forward to your feedback and your questions. Um, I will start by introducing all of them. We have Katarina Yakovlenko. She was a Fulbright Research and Development Program Fellow 2021 to 2022. She's right now at University College London in the School of Slavonic and East European Studies on a senior fellowship. And her topic today is looking at the Ukrainian landscape. For more extended biographies of our speakers, um, you can revisit our YouTube page or our Fulbright page where you'll find their full biographies and links. And this talk is going to be recorded and posted to our YouTube. So you can cite it, you can share it, you can revisit it later, send it to your grandma, your aunt, your dentist. Um, Asya Baizdareva is also with us today. She was a Fulbright Graduate Student Program Fellow 2015 to 2016. And she is in the Critical Media Lab in Basel, Switzerland, I believe, right now. And her topic is Field Notes on Subjectivity. Mayhill Fowler is a professor at Stetson University in Florida. And she was a Fulbright US Scholar to Ukraine 2019 2020. Her topic today will be Theater as Resistance to Empire Across Ukraine's 19th to 21st Centuries. And Lesa Kulchinska was a Fulbright Research Development Program Fellow 2018-2019. She's at Max Planck Institute for Art History in Rome, Italy. And her topic is State of Emergency, Artistic Practices of Navigating the Collapse. So we're gonna go in order of those introductions. We will begin first with Katarina Yakovlenko looking at the Ukrainian landscape. Hi, everybody. I'm really um, delighted to be here and to talk about Ukrainian art. And I just will try to share my screen and uh, hope it would be a very small but interesting journey to you. Um, so my question is how to look to Ukrainian landscape. It actually, also uh, what we understand now under the Ukrainian landscape. Uh, is it just an uh, image of nature? Is it image that we see uh, through our window, um, window at our home or like in the um, train, which now tapes uh, because of uh, a security uh, problem? Just a minute. But 
Um, when uh, this uh, spring, um, I have been asked to conduct the lecture about a uh, possible Ukrainian version of Kosmism, I was thinking um, to these influences of uh, war, violence, and its connection to the Ukrainian nature and Ukrainian landscape. I just don't know how I can uh, switch to the next slide. Uh, is it? Okay, I can try uh, to share screen again. Okay, so uh, of course the starting point to this question was uh, an artwork of Ilya and Emilia Kobakov, the man who flew into the space from his apartment. But honestly, looking to this exact art piece, I was thinking about all of these uh, damaged buildings and private houses in Ukraine um, that, uh, of course, not happened only uh, started in February 2022, but also started uh, in spring um, 2014, as we have uh, ongoing war since that time. And then, of course, I immediately recognize how this uh, connection uh, shaped my perspective uh, to rethink art history and especially Ukrainian art history. And perhaps the main interesting um, artwork in this case, it's a project made by Open Group um, created uh, on the previous uh, Venice Biennale. And okay, I again cannot. Uh, oh. Uh, so this is an image from this project. It's called The Shadow of the Dream, cast uh, over the Giardina della Biennale, and it was conducted in 2019 by Open Group. And the idea was uh, to create uh, an artistic gesture to decolonize uh, art history and especially Ukrainian art, and to look uh, to the connection between generation uh, and for especially Open Group. The question of their connection to the previous generation of artists are very important. Uh, the one of the key figures to them is Yuri Sokolov, who was a Lviv um, artist. Uh, but since, uh, uh, since uh, February uh, 2024, the idea of uh, using this uh, huge ca cargo air uh, plan on uh, 225 Maria uh, is become like really uh, connected to the idea of decolonizing our culture and seeing um, colonial and imperial um, influences uh, on on the all the history, and of course all of these uh, connections. Um, and this is a new work made by Nikita Zegura, um, 80 meters shadow of uh, 225 Maria giant on the Denmark fields. Uh, so the idea of using this um, optics of the colonizing art and uh, showing the uh, imperialistic um, uh, Russian policies uh, started be uh, the central and essential to me. But then I also find out how it's uh, connected to my perception of the landscape. And using the references to the Franz uh, Fanon uh, that uh, colonized people the most essential value because the most concrete, it's the first and foremost the land, the land which will bring um, uh, will, will will bring them bread and above all dignity. And I thought that it's um, not was present only in the art that was happened after the February 2022, but also much more earlier, like, for example, Yaroslav Futinsky, who did his performance, who all of these people who see in the same landscape is dedicated to the violence, uh, but not current violence, but the violence that was happening in the beginning of 20th century. And the story of this performance is a story of the small uh, place where Yaroslav Fotinsky was born and raised It's Paninka and Khmelnytsky region. And he dedicated this performance to the labors and labor strike uh, in 1905. Uh, people who were striking for their rights, for their freedom. Uh, this uh, protest was uh, violently uh, declined and all of these people lost their jobs and uh, um, 
and rights, but also the um, history of this resistance was uh, forgotten for a long time. And because of Yaroslav Fudimsky working a lot with the history and his, with archives, he decided to remind local people this um, history of resistance and uh, their belief in their rights. And he make this performance uh, in a desert landscape. No one seen his uh, performance except a couple of people and perhaps nature, uh, which he also recognized as an active actors of this place. And he become like a living monument because his hand was burning. Um, he left hand exactly was burning. And it's also some hard, uh, somehow um, continuing these ideas of left movements uh, and uh, uh, resilience. But also another interesting performance, it's uh, Yuri Lederman artwork, uh, which called, if you face the South, Moscow stays far behind. And it's also an interesting example, how we change our point of view and how we try, uh, change our angle to the same um, landscape. And it's, I would say that it's really a very similar question, which uh, Fatimsky asks. But also it shows um, the idea of uh, being in the center of what does it mean to be in the periphery right now. Exactly this performance was three minutes long. It not, uh, it's not very long. And perhaps many viewers who was at the time on the beach side and Odessa didn't recognize this gesture as an artistic gesture. But for, uh, for Yuri Lederman, it was uh, essential artwork and essential um, uh, gesture, yeah. And in his conversation with uh, Nikita Kadan, he said that uh, Moscow conceptualism or unofficial Russian art in general uh, provided that there can be a totality even after the concentration camp. This is a, a different type of totality. The totality of empire and context. Nobody puts you in the concentration camp, but you are imprisoned, increased in a context and cannot leave it. And the idea of these differences between um, uh, old narration or about international art and uh, Soviet art, because Yuri, Yuri Lederman also is a part of uh, Soviet art, is very uh, important now to rethink this tradition and to try to see different angles. And just to show you a couple more examples of the Soviet uh, Ukrainian art, how it was uh, connected with the idea of um, uh, militarism and also to uh, and connect with uh, cosmic ideas. It's uh, two drawings by um, Alla Horska, Birth of Happiness of 70s, and another one, the sketch of Mosaic's panel, Boreviter in the restaurant of uh, Ukraine uh, in Mariupol. And this exact work was destroyed by Russian army this um, uh, since uh, February 24. Exactly, we don't know which the day, but it was uh, happened uh, this summer. And just another couple of examples of recent works by uh, Vlada Ralko, uh, her series uh, from her drawings from the Lviv uh, diaries, uh, Dove of Peace, and the real exact image that she took uh, on the streets uh, in Kyiv. And, and just also show you one another artist, it's uh, Fedor Tetyanich, uh, whose exhibition you might see if you are in Vienna, in Vienna. And recently he was shown in Berlin as well. And he was working with this idea a lot, uh, trying to connect the environmental topic with artistic, but also in his diploma uh, during, uh, after the study in, uh, in uh, Kiev art school, uh, he wrote that the planet Earth is attached to his canvas, which is also, I think, very interesting um, understanding of, of how we perceive the landscape and our understanding of landscape. And just also a little bit more examples of 90s, uh, it's Petro Staruch, uh, this performance called Winter Kaput, and it's made uh, with a cooperation uh, with Sergei Jadan and Viktor Nabarank. An idea was that um, not only decolonize the art, but also decolonize the um, our traditional understanding, what kind of art do we have and what does what kind of materiality does have uh, art. And for example, for him, uh, as a person uh, who was 
uh, raised in a traditional understanding with that painting is a main uh, genre. Uh, he was trying to make this painting on the winter, um, on this uh, over the snow, and uh, he said that uh, this exact painting will be gone after spring will come. So the idea of uh, um, uh, reborn and the idea of uh, Endness, uh, endlessness, and also the idea of um, materiality of art is very important to this uh, artist. And another one, it's also made in the same year, Vodka Kaufman, uh, God's Love and Letters to the Earthling. Uh, it has uh, the same, exactly the same idea, but the artwork was made in the previous um, museum dedicated to the uh, some uh, Soviet, I don't uh, remember which exactly this museum was, but it was uh, something dedicated to the Soviet propaganda. And uh, he used a lot of uh, um, non-important stuff in this uh, performance. He used a lot of garbage and he also uh, wear the costume which uh, make from um, Folga or something like uh, like this, just to remind uh, the cosmic costume of uh, uh, people who are um, uh, on the space. And this is image of uh, Yuri Sokolov. Um, and again, going back to the idea of uh, cosmic influences, uh, I want to show you an artwork by Maria Primachenka made in 1977 where she uses not only references to the uh, cosmos exploration, but also you might see the coffins uh, and some idea of connection um, with a, like, as a living being and connection with the uh, people's deaths. Uh, um, and also in this case, I have to show you the uh, Font Mazach uh, work, uh, which called Art in Space. And this is uh, directly uh, made uh, by uh, Font Mazach uh, as an idea to show, uh, to make an exhibition in the space. And they conducted it on the um, uh, Ukrainian um, station uh, and asked to a person to take with them two small drawings uh, so basically, the artist was not presented in the space, but the artworks was there. Um, um, so it's also about our uh, presence and absence in the space and in the earth. Uh, but I guess that now uh, this, uh, the very same idea we can use uh, uh, because of military invasion, and uh, also we can rethink the artworks by uh, Valentin Rayevsky, who was uh, almost forgotten in Ukrainian context, and he was seeing um, landscape uh, very connected to this uh, idea of cosmos and militarism as well. Um, and he was taking uh, lots of images uh, on the Chernobyl zone uh, and make his uh, project called New Geographies, and he said. Like for example, that all of this uh, lost military equipment in Chernobyl, all uh, which we also completely uh, can approve and can see in uh, images uh, from the images of Bucha or Irpin or Mariupol, everything now creates our new um, geography and also influences on our identity as well. Um, but. The most interesting case to me, it's a preventive measure, measures uh, 2009 uh, project. And um, he was thinking how uh, the coloniz colonization works. And he creates a story about um, uh, cockroaches who uh, explore uh, the space and who come through the um, uh, uh, come uh, from the space and trying to colonize our land. Um, very peacefully. Um, and perhaps uh, in this case, the work by uh, Katya Buchatska, uh, which she made uh, from the land uh, from Bucha, Hastomil, and Moshun, it also shows this connection between identity and the ideas of decolonizing art. Uh, she um, find out, uh, being in Lviv, she find out that uh, she cannot um, 
use any more Ukrainian uh, uh, oil for uh, painting because uh, all of these factories was destroyed by Russian uh, militants. Uh, and she uh, started thinking how to do this uh, by herself and underst understood that uh, oil made by, uh, from the land. Uh, so she went to the Bucha, Moshun and Hastomil to took this land and create this uh, oil. So her abstract uh, painting, I would not say that they're abstract, they're very, um, they have huge uh, and very essential narrative uh, about, colonization, about imperialism, about resistance, about trauma, and about identity as well. Uh, and for Katya, who was looking for different questions and trying to rethink her own practice, this way of uh, rethinking uh, the methods, uh, the tools, and also the place for art is very become very important. So at the end, I would say that now, our understanding of uh, what we see and what we uh, trying to see in our landscape, it's not uh, just a view from our window, but also um, the history of um, our long resistance and uh, the uh, intellectual history and also the way of um, the way of how we trying to imagine new utopia uh, even being in war and even have uh, so um, brutal fights uh, on the east and um, south of our country. Thank you so much. Thank you, Katarina. Our next speaker is Asya Baizdareva and her title is Field Notes on Subjectivity. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, let me share my screen first, and then I can continue. All right. Now you can see it, right? Let's play it over here. It works. All right, then uh, thank you, Jessica, for the introduction and also for gathering us for this timely discussion. Uh, my presentation is based on some, um, some observations that I've been gathering after the Maidan and to present moment. So my main objective today, as it can be seen from the title, is to invite you to think about um, subjectivity and to identify together specific spaces in art and visual culture of the recent years where this subjectivity has manifested itself and should be articulated. Um, I will focus, now it doesn't work again. Mm -hmm. The screen, the, the, the slides are not working now. Um, I see a message. My, my, my screen sharing is paused, which I don't understand why. Now it works. So I will focus on, on, on three artworks um, that were created over the past uh, decade. And uh, I wrote about some of them extensively and some of you know my points of analysis already, but um, I will place them together, the three of them. And um, by this combination, uh, we can talk about subjectivity and okay something yeah when when i talk about subjectivity i don't mean it um in any abstract way um i am interested in a very um kind of specific uh subjectivity that was um, um that emerged over the past few decades of ukraine's independence and gained momentum um after during and after maidan and uh, historians later called it the new Ukrainian subjectivity or new hybrid and inclusive Ukraineness, uh, which is a product of Maidan. Um, and for example, historian uh, Ilya Gerasimov argued that 
Maidan with its focus on constructing a new society rather than litigating the past colonial experience was a unique event uh, in the post-Soviet uh, context. And it is important to articulate that throughout the Maidan, the new common values were uh, kind of produced and articulated. And these common values are at the center of what we can call now new and hybrid inclusive Ukrainians. So um, it is important that it was not uh, the past uh, with its uh, reliance on nationalism or religious fundamentalism that defined the Maidan, uh, but rather the idea of the future. And historians also argued that um, uh, a nation, a Ukrainian nation was the outcome uh, of the protest, not its reason. And uh, this is important, so I will reiterate uh, or emphasize the kind of the word outcome, uh, and I will come back to it a bit later. But it is important to understand that um, kind of the construction of new society that shares consensus about its declaration of civic subjectivity was the product of the protest, not, not a predecessing um, idea. So now I will talk about um, artworks. Sorry, this is annoying that the slides are not working properly. I don't know what to do with that. Um, maybe try stop. Share my yeah, screen and works. try again. Yeah, um, yeah, somehow it all freezes, so I don't know. Um, fine. So I'll start with uh, with Vladar Valko, and my focus is a different painting, but um, I know I probably some of you or many of you are familiar with her body of work, and on her works you always see an actual or actual bodies that are always somewhat mutilated, wounded, uh, abused, and bleeding. And so it is important to see that, again, these bodies um, are also indexes for particular socio-political relations. And it was in 2013 and 14 when she uh, was creating Kiev's diary that it was also recognizing that the, the bodies that she used and these two drawings uh, that you see were created around the time when Russia started annexation of Crimea. So the body that she uses are also kind of indexes of uh, a bigger entity such as country. And for example, she was using this uh, images that were reminiscent of uh, uh, modern doll, Ukrainian kind of Ukrainian uh, traditional doll, uh, but also reminiscent of uh, symbols of Berehina or symbols of motherlands. But some, something was happening to those bodies. Something was happening to those um, uh, also kind of like bigger images uh, to those other entities, political entities. Um, so this work that I want to begin with, it's the 2016 work, and it's just a fragment that you see. It's a massive triptych, triptych that was called in Russian, Toska Parodinia, so the original title was in Russian, and it can be translated as longing for the motherland. So this kind of motherland, the figure of the motherland is important. And what we see, uh, what we see in this painting is um, uh, a headless uh, body that feeds with her breast open as a wound and she breastfeeds uh, a child which has two heads and so uh, when analyzing as, as a, please to, please to share your uh, slides again because something happened with the presentation you cannot see them no okay sorry then it takes a second um it will take a second wait share screen so probably I'll just use the smaller format like this. Can you see it now? Yes, yes, no. Now we yeah. see, yeah. Yeah, and did you see the Motanka that I was talking no. about earlier? Okay, so this is this is the, the, the figure of the, the body that is also a Motanka or like a reminiscent of uh, Berehina. Uh, but the, the, the longing for the motherland. Um, so this is a massive triptych and you see this uh, kind of again mutilated body that fits uh, two or like one child with two heads. And earlier when I was analyzing Ralko's work, um, I first approached these wounded, wounded and mutilated bodies through the idea of body as a home, where a body is understood as a container, a uh, container of the self. And uh, the body is a protection from external physical or uh, symbolic threats. And of course, uh, in Valko's world uh, uh, works, all these bodies are mutilated. So it also signifies some sort of a destruction of this container of the self, the destruction of sovereignty, uh, we can say. And one of the instruments that I used to analyze this work uh, was the idea of um, object borrowed from Yulia Kristeva. 
Uh, and the object is the experience of corporeal reality in which um, I am not me. So in which uh, the separation of something from the body and the experience of the other is possible. And in a way we can say that object is the mother of all things because um, kind of in Christopher's philosophy, uh, it is the separation from the mother, both physically and later psychologically. So this is how uh, an individual becomes in the world. So this act of separation from mother's body and mother identity, mother figure, becomes a proto act of further division of world into objects and subjects and the construction of um, one's identity and the construction of the other. So in, 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 in Ralko's painting, this happens all the time. We see this kind of the body and we see something coming out of the body or coming back into the body. And these mutilated female bodies that have open or their breasts and vaginas are like wounds. So this is exactly the object. This is the experience of formation of identity or destruction of identity through a radical break with a particular body or with a particular symbolic order. So in this painting, we can, uh, we can, uh, uh, we can think of this body, uh, the headless mother figure, um, as a mother Russia, uh, and or we can think of its Soviet version. We can think of Rodina, and this is why the kind of the title is Russian. It says Taskapa Rodinia, and we can we can see this uh, the child with two heads as um, let's say Bratsky and Rode, like the brother nations that are connected. Uh, that are not separated from each other and that are also not separated from this figure of the Rodina. And uh, I interviewed Ralko in 2013 and she was saying that she was really fascinated um, how many people that she ever spoke to in her life uh, wanted to come back. Uh, they wanted Abratna, she used this word. They wanted to come back to, to Soviet Union, to this kind of a figure uh, of, of this mother from which they could not um, be separated. And uh, uh, Olena Stashkina, uh, uh, a Ukrainian philosopher, uh, a historian uh, from Donetsk who fled Donetsk when the war started eight years ago. So she wrote that uh, the USSR is this eternal fairy tale. It's a lure, it's a trap. It's an invented country with the voice of a siren that calls to come back and to fall asleep, to die. Um, so the next work that I will address is the work uh, by Mitya Churikov and many people, uh, friends and colleagues who participated in this project. Uh, so this, I find this project important uh, for, for, for a few reasons. So first of all, um, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll say a few words about the work uh, first. So what you see here, it's a documentation of, um, um, of uh, in, um, it, not improvised, but the, the staged, um, uh, pre-planned and pre-agreed occupation of the Ministry of Culture. And so you see people uh, with fires and people with banners that are in the building on, on, on the rooftop. And what you can read on the banners, uh, so these are the, the, the codes of behavior that are taken from BDSM culture. So you see that on the banners you can read, um, ask permission before entering, remember who you belong to, ask, always say please and thank you, dominate and submit. So this, uh, when, when uh, with this occupation, we see a situation where an artist uh, or a group of artists is in this um, uh, uh, power situation with an institution. And this modus that they use, they kind of denote the, the, the willful uh, kind of submission to the rules when the artist enters the, the institution. But it also kind of it also suggests that uh, in order to this uh, kind of collaboration to work, um, one needs to learn how to articulate their needs and how to be able to negotiate their own agenda. So why this work is important? Uh, so this was the first, uh, and some of you might know the context more. So this was the first um, uh, use biennial uh, in Ukraine, and it was funded by uh, Ministry of Culture. And it was hosted by Mestetsky Arsenal. So this was an interesting situation when Ministry of Culture, which is the funding body, uh, they had to uh, agree the request from curators and curators kind of uh, went through bureaucratic procedure in order to receive the agreement of Ministry of Culture to be occupied by artists. So the Ministry of Culture who 
selected the curators who funded this project, they couldn't say no to this. So they allowed the artists to occupy the place. And I think um, it's also important because this was the first time when uh, Mastetsky Arsenal, which was previously known for its rather uh, authoritarian um, uh, management, uh, it was also the, the moment when uh, it was the first, one of the first projects that the artists were selected through the open call, the institution got a new director, the, the operations of the institutions became more transparent. But what is important for me in this work that is uh, called We Are Here is that precisely we see, like as opposed to, for example, this uh, very set in stone imagination in Russia that there is the power and then there is the people. So here we see that actually people are part of this process and they have their agenda. And there is this understanding of we, of us, uh, that like if we have our agenda, we need to actually work uh, with these institutions. So it's not only that we do protests, we also need to think about what kind of, how do we inscribe our subjectivities through protocols and different operations of institutions so that they uh, take our agenda into consideration. And in that regard, uh, I wanted to share um, a quote from a book. Uh, of Irina Sandomirskaya, because for me it was uh, um, kind of important to understand what is the subjectivity that is emerging in Ukraine. And I must say that this spring when the war started, I watched lots of videos from uh, Russian liberals, whatever that means, on YouTube. And I was really fascinated by the fact that these Russian liberals, and they were like very, like in different parts of political spectrum, and they, they said different things, but at some point, every single one of them would, would say the word Rodina, and they would always say, Ya люблю свою Rodinu, I love my Rodina. And I was really fascinated, and I thought, what does it mean? Because, for example, I don't hear these things in Ukraine, this kind of like, I, I, Ya люблю, I love my Rodina, or whatever. So I was really interested to understand what does this mean, and I found the answer in uh, the book of Irina Sandomirska. And I think it's really amazing how she explains that Rodina, in fact, is this kind of idealized, uh, poeticized, aestheticized thing, and she places it in the opposite to the civic society, because, and I think all my colleagues from Ukraine know it, because when you are part of civic society, you are constantly fighting for something, you are doing these bureaucratic things, you are going through all sorts of like protocols and everything. So it's a different relationship and you cannot say, I love my Rodina, just because you have a completely different understanding of the place that you are operating with. And of course we all, or like many of us will love Ukraine, but somehow the rhetorics of it is always, always um, different. And with this, I want to, uh, to, to come to Katya Lisvenka's work uh, that was created um, two days before the invasion on February 24th. And it was exactly the day, um, and all of us, we remember those times, the fatigue, the anticipation of the, the invasion. And it was exactly at the time that the, the, the Russian president um, had his speech where he was talking about Ukraine as this object, and he was talking about how Ukraine uh, has a debt to the empire that she that Ukraine owns it and and so far and so forth, and 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 Kata was thinking about kind of where is the the actual Ukraine subjectivity in this process, like what if uh, what if Ukraine doesn't want to like where uh, and somehow this kind of the not willingness to submit to that narrative is um, self evident in this work, but I wanted to point your attention to a different thing in this regard that um, I think it is interesting that here we also have this, the, the, the body, the mother, we also have a child, and it's already kind of a very different situation that we saw in 2016 in, in Vlada's work, where this kind of the, the figure of this child, child was still unclear. But it is important, I find that uh, Katya, so she takes this visual um, uh, kind of language that was forming for like uh, hundreds of centuries, like many centuries, uh, the kind of the, the, the legacy of Christianity where there's always a mother, there's always a child, and then kind of how it was uh, um, appropriated by various other visual cultures, including the Soviet culture that kind of like uh, heroicized this mother that produces babies so then they can go to war and die. So she wants to create a different narrative different from Maria who has a Jesus and the Jesus is born to die and none of this was their choice. 
also like a Russian or like a Soviet mother that produces babies because then they can all go and die in war. So she wanted to like um, kind of reappropriate this visual language and deconstruct it. And she creates a mother that does not produce a baby. So then it dies. And the baby also has a say, the baby also is not born to die and he or she or they, they, they say it in this picture. And I think this is important. And I think it's really amazing that um, now when Ukraine is in, in the war and we know that it costs so many lives, but there is still this conversation around that each life matters and that we do not produce lives so then they die. We do not heroicize this war. And I think that also links back to the, 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 the articulation of subjectivity as it was um, kind of manifested during the Maidan that starts from the idea that every individual's life has a value and then all this like plur plurality of life can arrive to a particular consensus regarding their kind of political situation and so on. And with that, I will finish and I'll have just one more slide from uh, Olena Stashkina, the Ukrainian uh, historian. And this is an entry from her diary <clears throat> that she wrote on March 1st, 2014. This is the day, as some of us remember, the day uh, where it was already clear that the war starts eight years ago. And I think to, I want to reiterate this idea of the outcome of the child. So like, and, and to kind of oppose the, the motherland, the Rodina to the civic society. So I think with this kind of the Rodina, the idea that there is this mother to which you submit the, the power figure, and it's completely opposite when you see the, the, the your place, your community as something that is kind of a product of your activity rather than, uh, rather than, um, rather than an idea that pre-existed before you. So I'll read this fragment from her diary and this will be my last um, comment. So she writes, um, on Saturday at 1922, I took Ukraine in my hands. Long labor, 23 years, she might not even be born. I, look, I took her in my arms, looked into her eyes and dissolved. My little, golden, poor, only one, my careless happiness, joy. Now it is time for the diapers, fatigue and irritability. Sometimes she misbehaves. But if we give up all the naughty, noisy children for adoption, then why leave at all? So I kiss her forehead, I inhale the smell, I love. Sometimes she even let me sleep. Motherland is a child, not the mother. Thank you. Thank you, Asa. Our next presentation is by Mehil Fowler and the title is Theater as Resistance to Empire Across Ukraine's 19th to 21st Centuries. Great. Um, thank you so much. Um, that was such a moving quote. Um, so we need a, move, a moment to move on. Um, thank you so much for having me on this really brilliant panel. Um, my talk draws on my work as a historian and a scholar of theater. Um, and I will just share my screen here. Let's see. Um, great. So I want to share my thoughts on um, an epistemological problem that I've been wrestling with for some time, but urgently since February 24th, and that is how to tell Soviet history. Much of my work is on Soviet history. I was trained as a Soviet historian, and much of my writing has been about trying to reconcile artists as both part of larger imperial structures, and yet also part of a, lo a locality, a place called Soviet Ukraine. And that is taking Soviet Ukraine seriously as a place, as a concept, as a culture. And my book argued that these theater artists were artists who were both Soviet and Ukrainian and something actually called Soviet Ukrainian, and that they were part of the building of the Soviet cultural infrastructure because they believed in art and they believed in art's ability to change the world. And I felt that the dichotomy of artist versus state or Ukrainian versus Soviet somehow deprived them of agency and complexity. And I still think that's true. But the connection and continuity between the violence and lack of care towards individual lives that we see between the USSR and post-Soviet Russia today, I think has required for me a shift in my thinking through this phenomenon of Soviet Ukraine, how to describe it, how to analyze it, and how to tell the story of its people, how to tell the story of Soviet Ukrainians. How do we decouple the experience 
here from the totalizing Soviet narrative, which tends to be very Russia dominant. And I want to avoid what I think very much my generation of Western historians was trained to do, which is to see my region, Ukraine, as a case study, right? A case study of this larger Soviet phenomenon. And rather, I want to make a switch to put this region at the center. And so can we see Ukraine as having a Soviet period in the chronology of artistic production in the region? What does it mean to put this place at the center and step outside the totalizing centripetal force of Soviet history and post-Soviet Russian history? And this is a process precisely because stepping into decoloniality means stepping away from canons, hierarchies, structures of knowledge production that schools and scholars in the West often took unconsciously actually from the Soviet that reproduced hierarchies of Russia as center, Ukraine as periphery. And so what if we focused on Ukraine as center of its own story? What would the story be of how the imperial, the Soviet, the post unfolded in this place? And so I want to give a few examples of what I mean by this sort of centering of Ukraine by focusing on my special specialty, which is theater in Ukraine. Um, so I'm actually going to start pre-Soviet. This, as most of you on this uh, webinar know, is Maria Zankovatska, 19th century diva of the Ukrainian stage. In the late 19th century, the Russian Empire prohibited the publication and performance of the Ukrainian language. Right With the 1863 Polish uprising, it was dangerous to promote Ukrainianness. But to make a long story short, a group of ex-military got together and started doing professional Ukrainian language theater in the 1880s, working around these prohibitions in really, really fascinating ways. And they had to write an entire repertory because of a censorship stipulation that European or Russian plays could not appear in Ukrainian translation on the stage. So they had to write a whole repertory to perform, and they did. And because this region was a breadbasket and it had been a center of serfdom, they wrote plays largely about the failures of emancipation and the struggles in the post-emancipation village. And interestingly, actually, through this theater, we it's melodrama, but we actually learned quite a lot about the challenges of the village life in this period. Violence, class, property, and women losing out each and every time. And as we know, this is the Teatr Karifeyev, the theater of the stars, um, and Maria Zankovatska was its star. They were wildly successful, even performing for the Tsar in St. Petersburg, ironically, during a time when they were not allowed to perform in Kiev region. And it was on this trip that Zankovatska actually posed for the photographer who was taking photos for the Russian edition of Darwin's Expressions of Emotions in Humans and Animals. She could have stayed in the capital, she was invited to stay, but she preferred to go back to Ukraine or to the Southwest region of the Russian Empire as it was then, um, because she was devoted to place. And this group of artists, the Teatr Karifeyev, however much they switched groups and the, the companies shifted and changed, they were all devoted to place, to Ukrainian lands, Ukrainian audiences, and they created a belonging in empire. And today, we might criticize the Karifeyev repertory as one shackled by empire. And it was. These were plays about the village because that's all they were permitted to perform. They couldn't tell their story of urban life because of regulations from an oppressive imperial center. But what's interesting to me is that they created an entire repertory that spoke to an audience. And think of the challenges, the manipulations, the creativity required to promote Ukrainian language theater in the Russian Empire, and they did it. And by continuing to tell stories in Ukrainian, and these were the stories of some Ukrainians, they dug their heels in, in this place, resisting empire. And never mind, of course, Zankovetska herself resisting the patriarchy to pursue a career when women of her class just did not do that making choices that were against all the conventions of her time. So we can see them as crushed by empire, but I suggest seeing the capacity to create a world and an entire belonging in an oppressive empire. What if we put them at the center of our study of theater? And as a theater scholar, I'll say that in theater history, the 19th century is all about Stanislavski and the Moscow art as we move into the 20th century, Mayor Hold moving away from the Moscow art, but if we put the Corifei at the center, we see a different picture. We see the ways military life created the arts. We see the ways imperial minorities created new audiences. And in fact, you know, the other example that I think of, of, of a, of a non-Russian minority that invented an entire repertory is Yiddish theater, 
actually there were you know re regulations against Yiddish theater as well and and yet somehow this repertory in this world um, emerged both Yiddish and Ukrainian theaters did this and perhaps these stories of itinerant troops crisscrossing the borderlands is actually more significant than Stanislavski and his company on their trains Stanislavski it is said shaped American theater but just as significantly did Yiddish theater Stella Adler who translated Stanislavski for an American audience, famously, was the daughter of Yiddish theater stars from Odessa and then Second Avenue, New York, Sarah and Jacob Adler, after all. So when we put them at the center, Stanislavski fades. He becomes one story among many of people trying to make a career and empire. And then perhaps we can see the long lasting legacy of the Carrefier. Kitsch, sure, problematic, sure. But long lasting, yes. Speaking to audiences over a century, Yes. Deserving a wider audience and more scholarly attention? I think so, yes. So let's skip forwards and talk about the subject of my book, which is Las Curvas and the Berezil. As you know, in the 1920s, this was the largest state-funded theater in Soviet Ukraine, in the capital, Kharkiv, and it was extraordinary. And yet it remains known largely only to Ukrainian specialists or Ukrainians. And this is very important, right? And there's a lot of reasons um, that we can think of that we know to explain that. Um, but it's very important, right? This is a major theater and it really isn't much known outside um, our circle. And this is my favorite show. This is actually not directed by Kurvas, but by his three protégés, all of whom would be major figures in theater in Soviet Ukraine, even after Kurvas's murder in 1937. And this is a really important point that he created a school and a generation of theater workers that one finds running theaters in Soviet Ukraine well into the 50s and 60s. And so, this is the first ever Ukrainian musical review, Hello from Radio 477. It was inspired by uh, cabaret shows in Weimar Berlin, where they went in 1927 and 1928. They saw a bunch of shows, a bunch of different theaters, um, including at a cabaret called Scala, um, which was known for its line of dancing girls, which you can kind of see here, and then you, you know, see them um, here um, on this photograph. There they also bought lighting equipment, um, which you see in the rings here that they used um, in the set design for this show. So this was an utterly European, European inspired cultural product, but it was also pure Soviet Ukraine, including jokes about Moscow um, of several kinds and basically always sort of making fun of Moscow, thinking they know everything when they don't. That is, this show positions its place as the center. I'll also say it was utterly unique and unlike anything in all of the USSR that I've seen, and I say that not only just as a Ukrainianist, but having presented on this show in multiple fora, um, I've really gotten a lot of response that indeed this is a really weird, interesting um, and unique show. Um, on this slide, we can see these literary figures um, in masks. Um, one of them is Khulivy, one of them is Vishnya, and they're with these um, dancing girls um, in a cafe. Um, here, um, we see this is from Act 3, we see Ostap Vishnya um, here, or an actor playing Ostap Vishnya. He's shown hunting, and he really did go hunting. Um, here is his prey, this line of actresses dressed as ducks. Um, and in this act, apparently Baba Yaga emerged and then put him, because he was going to shoot the girl ducks, in a Vishnyak bottle. Um, it's utterly strange. But it's a totally local theatrical product telling a local story and that is resisting the pull to the imperial center so typical of Soviet culture. Beyond Berezil, I'd like to highlight another aspect of theater in this golden age of Kharkiv, which is Yiddish theater. Um, most scholars of Yiddish culture only know about Solomon Mikhoyles and Gosset in Moscow, and they were great, um, but they were a niche company in Moscow. The heartland of Yiddish theater was here in Soviet Ukraine where there was a Yiddish division of the Theater Institute. There was a Yiddish puppet theater that won second place in an all union puppet theater competition in 1938. And that is the center of Yiddish language theater culture was here. This also reminds us of the multi-ethnicity of Soviet Ukraine of this region, which I think is one of its really important markers and one of the key features shaping creative production. Jews, Poles, Russians, Ukrainians, all made Soviet Ukrainian culture. Some directors crossed over, some designers did, and there was mutual inspiration. And um, for example, this show pictured here called Schleck, The Little Devils, um, 
is from the Yiddish theater in Kyiv in 1929. And you can see it's sort of got this line of dancing girls um, and seems to me to be very similar, to have a lot of similarities with Hello, which was also 1929. We know there was some sociability between these companies. So what kind of mutual inspiration was there between um, these different theater companies? Um, and I think that there's a larger argument here about the benefits of diversity or how diversity works in creative production. And in fact, I would argue that Ukraine is a case study in diversity, the ways that living among others impacts creative production. So despite the homogenization of Soviet culture, the ways that it had this centripetal pull to the center um, to fit ideological norms, what unfolded in Soviet Ukraine reflected its own influences, its own populations, it's just different. And that difference is crucial for seeing how this region experienced the Soviet in its own way. It's not Moscow, it's not Russia, and it's Soviet Ukraine. And so think about this, what if we included this, Kurbas, Yiddish theater, in wider studies on Soviet or indeed Eastern European theater? I think we might then have stories about how, di how diversity matters in theatrical production and reception and how creativity can come from imperial borderlands as much, if not more so, than centers. So I'll skip forward again to wartime, but pre-February 2022. Another specificity to this place that is today Ukraine is the transformation of cultural infrastructure that was successful in the post-Soviet period. Unlike in Russia, Ukraine quite seriously cut a lot of funding to the arts in the 90s after the Soviet collapse. And so what happened was people had to create solutions. They had to create new workarounds, co-productions, grants, new ways of thinking about the audience and stakeholders. In 2015, MP Irina Podolyak put through a package of legislation that changed the structure, um, which most of you probably know, called the theater laws, um, making, for example, five-year positions for artistic directors, not life getting rid of the previous position of managing director, which had been this Soviet legacy sort of managing party ideology and making all appointments transparent. There's a lot of discussion and debate about these laws. There have been challenges, but they really changed the landscape actually. They really brought a new generation into theater leadership. We saw a lot of new faces, a lot of women, a lot of new funding opportunities. And this of course is also the time of the creation of new institutions like the Ukrainian Cultural Fund, Ukrainian Institute, both of which funded and promoted new people, new projects. Decentralization politically, which is the topic of a lot of um, political science research, also meant decentralization culturally. And theaters received more funding or more opportunities for funding from local city councils. And so this new cultural infrastructure shapes what stories can be told. Um, and you really see this difference um, with Russia where theater still has to rely on this sort of in between the lines and subtext. And in Ukraine theater could really speak quite directly. And this resists empire. It resists the pull of the post-Soviet um, empire. And I have to say that I've witnessed through seeing a lot of theater in the past several decades, I've witnessed Ukraine moving away from this post-Soviet into a complicated, complex, often frustrating, democratic, changing, dynamic, artistic, theatrical landscape. I'm not diminishing any challenges that I know many of you on this webinar have experienced, but I wanna highlight the way that Ukraine has moved out of the orbit of Russia and the post-Soviet challenge of infrastructure. Theater in Ukraine was not theater in Russia and it's really important. And since 2014, for example, there have been so many theater productions about the war and speaking directly about the war in really interesting and complex ways. And I think that Ukraine really solved that crisis in emerging from the post-Soviet infrastructure. Um, this is one example. This is the former Soviet army theater in Lviv. You kind of can't get more Soviet than that. That is now a very cool Ukrainian language theater, Teatr Lasi, with an activist artistic team that got city money to renovate their building. And I think this quote is really important. It's my city um, renovating my theater, the sense of sort of ownership of not only the people inside the theater itself, but the people walking by on the street, being able to connect themselves with this theater um, and with this city and with this um, practical process of, of renovating the building. Place matters. And so what if we paid attention to how Ukraine and Russia had totally different paths in the 30 years of independence for cultural infrastructure? We then might wanna include other cases and we could think about the factors that lead to such radically different outcomes for these places. We also see Ukraine as very much a part of European theater. I can point to the ways residencies, grants, festivals, 
throughout the EU over the past decades have shifted the theatrical landscape in Ukraine um, towards Europe. It's a European story. And of course, that's true even today, right? Um, where there's so many theater artists traveling through or working in Europe, and that's going to change European theater, right? So this is not just a one-way street. Um, it's dynamic, dynamic relationship. And so what I've tried to do here is focus on place, on unwinding the imperial thread and its hierarchies and canons, stepping outside canons, outside structures that have promoted certain artists or certain stories in our imaginations. Because what is important is stories and thinking about how stories emerge and the power that they have to shape our understanding of the world. What stories will be told of this war? Who will tell them? For whom? Where? How? I think thinking critically about how stories of theater have been so historically dominated by empire, both physically and epistemically, I think helps us grapple with the necessity today of supporting theater artists now as they tell stories and the necessity of creating space for new stories, stories that might be unexpected, that might be uncomfortable to emerge from this war into a post-war theatrical landscape. Thank you very much. Thank you, Meho, for that very moving um, provoking um, presentation. All of what we've heard today so far has um, really so much resonance, uh, one for the other presentation. And I wanna make sure we, we do get to questions, but we have one more speaker today, Leso Kolchinska, and the title of her presentation, State of Emergency, Artistic Practices of Navigating the Collapse. Thank you, Jessica, for introducing me, and uh, thank you so much ever, to everyone uh, who spoke today for your brilliant presentations. I, I really enjoy listening to it. I just wanted to correct uh, that uh, the title of my presentation is not State of Emergency, but State of Emergence. Uh, and uh, this is a very crucial difference. And uh, today, during the, the previous presentations, I heard this word so many times, emerging, emerging, something is emerging, like everyone was speaking about something which is emerging. So one moment, I also will try to share the screen. Uh, okay, let it be up. One moment. Just want to make um yes so um you see the the picture right yes yeah, so um uh i want um, to start from some like very personal uh, moment uh and i want to uh, kind of uh, confess that this uh, title of my presentation which is a state of emergence uh, was uh, for a long time something like a therapeutic motto for me that helped me uh, sustain the reality of war. Uh, it came to my mind maybe after one month of war, the most difficult months for me when the feeling that the whole reality was collapsing was permanent. Uh, during these first months, I felt tremendous difficulties in communication, even, in, even with the closest people. Uh, all the words seemed the wrong, the wrong and unreliable or even dangerous to me. And most of my routine and habitual actions, reactions or gestures seemed uh, inappropriate and redundant as the reality, whether they uh, were relevant or needed was lost. Um, I was confused and kind of unlearned how to live, but uh, somehow I kept going. And at some point I noticed uh, that I actually already started reinventing all those tiny hooks uh, that were meant to keep me grounded in reality. I felt that um, in the place of loss, there were no vacuum, in fact. Something was constantly emerging and evolving there. So at that point, I remembered this proximity between uh, these two words, emergency and emergence. I remember that uh, several uh, years ago, uh, at the background of the war in Donbass, I wrote those two words in my notebook to fix uh, the thought uh, that emergence might be the flip side of the collapse of emergency as an extreme danger. Uh, at that time, I was thinking that probably every emergence of something new is already, in a sense, uh, a catastrophe as it brings the end to what was before because every new emergence changes uh, the whole constellation. 
this time when I was reflecting on these connections between on, um, on this connection between these two words, I was thinking that emergence of something is maybe an inevitable outcome of an emergency. Uh, because when everything is collapsing, then everything is emerging anew somehow. When your life is falling apart, then you have to reinvent it in you with every step. And this idea gave me hope as it uh, let me believe that my country is not just a site of destruction or devastation, but also the site of persistent creation, where in the cracks of the smashed reality, the sprouts of something new are growing. Uh, so um, it seemed to me very inspiring, this uh, thought. So I initiated and uh, curated the exhibition, which was called State of Emergence which opened uh, on April 15 on, in Bucharest. And you now see the view, uh, exhibition view from, the, from this show. This exhibition was actually my practice uh, of shifting from fear and uh, thoughts about death and destruction to the attention to every tiny manifestation of life, of life. It seems to me that focusing on the process of emergence would somehow strengthen, uh, strengthen them. Uh, now, uh, in the context of this main question of this panel about how war shapes art, I started to think what exactly was and is emerging and how can I describe it. Uh, I looked uh, at this exhibition again and to be honest, I realized that I find it difficult to answer this question. When I look at this show now, it seemed to me very sad. Most of the works uh, speak about some painful, uh, painful laws. Uh, so maybe I will show some of them to you because I, I don't think I have time to show everyone. Do, do you see the next slide? This is a uh, work by uh, Dasha Chichushkova, which is uh, called The White Flag uh, Ghost of Home, uh, which tells uh, about loss of community, loss of place and loss of understanding who you are without all those things that uh, continues, uh, constitutes your or, or constituted your world and divine to you as a personality. So she thinks about herself as becoming white, like a bl blank page as an anonymous or as a ghost. Because what uh, she was, it was who she was, was defined by the environment that she's been uh, immersed into, by her friends, by her community, by her place. And uh, leaving this place is uh, also like losing the feeling who you are. Um, this is also her performance uh, that she did during the opening. Um, and um, one moment, I want to show you another work, uh, which is similar somehow. Um, this is the, the work by Katya Buchatska. Maybe you already saw it because it's now exhibiting a lot. Uh, this is the work by Katya Buchatska, which is called Alarm uh, Table Clothes. And it's again about the loss of home or about the, the place that you belong to. This table clause was presented to her by the people who hosted her when she left Kyiv and moved to some other uh, town in Ukraine. Uh, so she put uh, all the things that she had in her backpack uh, to this table clause that, that was a present and outlines them. Most of the things uh, that she had in her backpack, she says, turned out to be some unnecessary objects like presents from friends uh, or some souvenirs. So the table clothes uh, uh, that now keeps their contours are something like a memory map of this loss of this material uh, uh, materiality that constituted her world. Uh, another work that uh, also like very similar in the, in the in the mood is the work by Vitaly Yankovy, which was uh, which cons uh, cons consisted of different elements. It was a video. Uh, here's some screenshots and this. Um, uh, concrete ways. Uh, so uh, this uh, artwork was called Glass House, and it was also about the lost home. But home uh, not uh, as not only a place where you live, but as a place that, that uh, you can think you you can link your future with. So for him, uh, uh, this vase is something uh, is a symbol of this uh, feeling of rootedness, because as he told me. You buy the base for your uh, for your home if you're going to stay there. It's something unnecessary. It's something that you cannot take with you when you are moving. So if you if you're buying the base, it means that you see your future here in this place. So in this work, uh, this space is transformed into something like a ghost of this lost feeling of rootedness, of this uh, a lost feeling of of the future that is linked linked to certain um, 
certain place. Uh, another work uh, that is that refers to a little bit different um, issue, but still is linked to this feeling of loss, is the uh, uh, the painting or the drawing. I don't know how to define it correctly by Boris Kashava, which is called the uh, Away, and it is actually about the loss of voice and uh, the loss of vision. Uh, this work is created as a result of ongoing attempts to express uh, the experience of what is going on and the failure of these attempts. As uh, the artist says, since the war started, he cannot stop checking the news and feels so overwhelmed by the flow of these media images of war that when he tries to draw something, he cannot discriminate his own voice uh, from the media imprints on his thoughts and images. So the images that he produces uh, doesn't seem uh, his own to him anymore. And he washes them away and they uh, paint again and then wash again. So this painting is a result of constant try, tries to, to say something and the failures of it. So he paints and wash and paints and wash. And um, it's actually the never ending process. Uh, and so when I was thinking of, about this work, I realized that in a way, uh, this work uh, for me is a manifestation of certain stubbornness of a creative drive. Because despite of the collapse of the vision and inability to, to, to express the need and desire to express, to leave a trace still prevails. And the title of the work, uh, which is Away, declares that even when the direction is absent and the map is lost, the way is still somehow possible. And when I was thinking about uh, the persistent manifested uh, by this work, I realized that this is actually something all of the works of the show have in common. All of the works that uh, were presented there were, creating, were created during the war against the background of the ongoing collapse of habitual symbolic and material structures. Yet all of them were the manifestation of the desire to transform this painful loss into something tangible, something that is present, something that exists and radiates life. At the beginning uh, of war, I uh, interviewed the artist and the curator, Lesa Komenko, about uh, the residency program uh, Assortment Room that she uh, co curated and co founded. Um, Found uh, so she told me that during the war, when everything was falling apart, uh, she discovered uh, the great need to create something material, something tangible. So when they started this um, residence, the first thing that she did, she bought a lot of materials like paints, canvases, um, clay to to produce some like material objects. And she said that that was a, like a huge therapeutic moment for all of the participants of the residency program. Uh, so I'm thinking about that all those works that emerged out of the feeling of loss uh, is in a way, in a way absorbed all those love to everything that was vanishing and be became like a containers of those feelings of attachment and love to, to something that is falling apart. Uh, and here uh, I want to show you another very subtle uh, very subtle uh, artwork presented also in this show, which is um, uh, The Birds by Tamara Turlun. Uh, a tiny wooden birds that she produces in a huge amount. And she uh, started producing the birds together with her partner to handle the feeling of despair and helplessness. Uh, they started uh, selling those birds and donating money uh, to the army. Uh, and. Um, Somehow with those birds, they transformed despair into hundreds of tiny shields to protect life. Uh, and uh, here I also want to show you another work by uh, Katya Lislovenko that you might already saw, The Garden of Sorrow. Uh, which uh, when you look at it, it conveys the feeling of extreme uh, vulnerability. Uh, yet, uh, similarly to Tamara's birds, this naked and fragile female, female figure of complete insecurity, um, at the same time, it embodies protection because uh, regardless of being totally exposed, at the same time, she is a shelter herself that protects her child. Uh, so uh, when I'm asking myself what is uh, emerging from the state of emergency, I'm thinking about the 
community of stubborn survivors, a community of those who discovered the fragility and the value of life and um, are now united with this desire to protect it and to protect each other. And the work, uh, uh, another work also presented in this show by um, Stas Turina, the work which is called Thank You. And as you see, uh, this is the drawings where the word thank you in Ukrainian Dyakoyu is written. And he produces also in big amounts uh, and use uh, those works as a certain currency. So when, uh, for example, he, he's doing a lot of volunteering and when someone uh, donates money to his volunteering uh, projects, he uh, like paying back with this uh, uh, drawing with the word thank you. And for me, uh, this work by Stas Turina became uh, like a crucial symbol of my wartime experience uh, as the sign of this per persistent feeling of gratitude to all those efforts to protect life and to, to help each other. And um, um, how all this, how, uh, uh, how does it all uh, relate to the question of the coloniality? Uh, uh, like the core of any colonialism is uh, actually exploitation, right? And it's a, a certain approach in politics and economy based uh, on the um, treating of human being and human life as a mere resource. My resources that uh, should be used uh, for something much more important, like capital or imperial power, and uh, we can um, ex we can uh, observe exactly these attitudes from the Russian part during this war, where the even the Russian citizens are treated like a mere uh, you know materials that can be used and thrown away. So um, in this relation, I think. Uh, that maybe this discovery and uh, somehow very deep uh, experience of this value of human life is something very important that, uh, that is emerging and something that uh, um, I think ma may, maybe will change. Uh, because I, I know that uh, um, this attitude, this, uh, this attitude to human, uh, to human being and to human life as a something like as a, as a resource was also part of our colonial legacy because it was uh, practiced during the uh, Soviet Union and during imperial times and I think it was uh, you, you could feel it in Ukrainian politics for a long time so this uh, rediscovery uh, and not only discovery but something that you live through your own experience of this value of human life and human ties this is maybe uh, I hope could be a ground for some new type of uh, society um yes and the, the last thing that i wanted to say that of course um uh yes today uh, i met uh, an artist jana Bocinska, for occasion and she told me that she just opened an exhibition uh, which is dedicated to the um, artworks that cannot be shown during the war because and i know it also from my own conversations with different artists because uh, like uh, in this situation of emergency, a lot of things should be somehow muted. So many topics, especially like critical thoughts or something like very personal is not up to date. And a lot of artists are kind of keep uh, remaining silent on many things because it's not the, like the proper time to, to say that. Because now we should be like unified in, uh, in this war. So I was thinking that the, mm, most likely then the war will over will be over the society will flourish uh, with uh, now all this muted uh, with uh, all this now muted antagonisms and contradictions uh, now we are, of course are fighting together against uh, the common enemy but the the vision of peace that we struggle uh, for might be very different for each of us and of course uh, while we are like keep uh, muted all those antagonisms uh, this uh, like uh, dissatisfactions might be growing might be also like something that is emerging and that that would probably explode after the war will over yet uh, i hope that this experience of the value uh, and extreme fragility of life and our gratitude to each other will be those ground that will help us to be patient and gentle to our to each other regardless of all those contradiction. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lessa, and all of our speakers. Um, just so much to absorb here. 
I want to um, also thank our audience who um, has has been so patient and gracious. We've had a few questions, comments in the chat. If you have more questions, comments, please um, feel free to post them there um, or raise your hand. Uh, if you would like to ask a question to any of our speakers, I'll open up the floor to the audience. The speakers yet. Um, I guess I will. Oh, Lon Kaufman, you're muted. there thank you well thank you i just want to say thank you to to all of you um uh many different comments or little notes i put to next to points that all four of you made but um i guess the general comment more just a comment than like some erudite question um i lived in kiev um in 2002 to 4 and then 2011 until 17 so i was there during Euromaidan. And I remember after Euromaidan, when Crimea happened and then the war in the Southwest, um, I wasn't even thinking specifically about it, but as I, you know, in retrospect, it did come to my mind if I, you know, every day I go down to the center on Krushatik or whatever, and people are living like their normal life, right? And yet there's a war going on. And uh, people, as families around the country, whose son or father just died, to them suddenly it's very personal. They don't they don't walk downtown and you know drink a cup of coffee with friends, but they're mixed in with all these other people who are are coping with it by um, I don't mean this disrespectfully, but but kind of denial. Like that was the that was like the way they seemed to get on. But now uh, being <clears throat> not in Ukraine, not in Kiev, I just I can't help but think you know how do people particularly the creative ex people who are expressing themselves creatively. You know, how do you get past that? That is, for me, it would be anger. I don't think I could get past the anger <laughs> to be creative. So I, just a comment would be, I appreciate, you know, all the, the examples of artists who have been making work, you know, during this period. And um, I guess that's all, maybe just a gratitude. And I'm I'm happy that people are working through ways to, to deal with so the idea of gift like say, the little birds you know and then these paintings in, in response to donations i was just thinking that there's something in that about giving you know during a time when you just want to uh hibernate you know and it seems like something magical maybe about that that's all thank you lon very much for mentioning um giving and also um, doing critical work, critical deeds for Ukraine and Ukrainians. I will post in the chat um, a link to compiled resources at Harvard Ukraine Research Institute for anyone here interested. Also wanna flag the Fulbright Ukrainian Alumni Association. Kolo is a registered NGO in Ukraine and they uh, rely on grant writing and, and donations and they, um, are very active in all spheres in Ukraine right now, especially in the scholarly communities. Uh, but also want to give others here a chance to speak. Anybody, anybody uh, braving the airwaves today? Okay, can I ask a question? Uh, yeah, I'm yes. Maria Shumchishin yes. uh, from Cape National Linguistic University. And uh, I'm very thankful, first of all, to the organizers of this event and also to the presenters. It was very interesting to listen to all the presentations. Yes, and it was inspiring for me. Mm -hmm. um, my question is maybe to all the presenters that we have today, because more or less they are um, they all um, touched uh, to some extent this issue of uh, identity and uh, the issue of collective identity, the Ukrainian collective identity. And during this unjustified uh, and uh, barbaric war uh, that we have just now in Ukraine, uh, it seems to me that we have the emerging, referring to, uh, to the last presentation, uh, we have the emerging of a new type 
of uh, our collective identity. And uh, it's good as um, um, Mayhel uh, mentioned also to put uh, Ukraine into the center of this discourse, um, discourse of uh, um, post-colonialism uh, or uh, decolonization process. But um, um, what about can um, what about this very popular slogan that we have during this war period? Let's cancel Russia. And um, if we put Ukraine into the center, do we need to refer again uh, to all these Russian uh, narratives uh, about motherland um, or about love or about um, uh, patriotism, whatever, uh, superiority, inferiority, dominance, and so on. Let's just cancel Russia and um, mm, do not refer to their concepts of um, motherland, um, love, whatever. We, we love Ukraine, yes, and uh, mm, mm, we don't need to compare or we don't need to contextualize uh, our love into this broader paradigm uh, of um, this um, post-colonial rhetoric. Uh, so, and the question, my question is in the end to, to all of the presenters, yes? So, um, uh, it's true that new kind of collective identity is emerging now, yes? But uh, what, what is your personal um, idea about this new collective identity? Thank you. So, anyone from the panel want to? Jump in. I can start perhaps with uh, uh, your comment on canceling Russian culture. And I think uh, that we have to look at this question more broadly because, of course, we cannot cancel Russia from all the cultural and educational field. We cannot cancel all the institution. This is already something which is embodied in the international structure. And the way how we can uh, work with that, how we can uh, fight with that is um, to try to look more deeply to peripheries, which I already said that we have to change these connections between center and peripheries, and also maybe try to decolonize our understanding, uh, our understanding of what um, does political geography means right now? Where is this, like, what actually the Europe right now? Um, and also speaking about uh, this concept of uh, decolonizing culture, I think it's a very important thing that it's, I can divide it for two. Uh, first one is values, uh, which we try to promote with our culture. And second one, that culture is very material and cancel in Russian culture. This is the way how we would not support Russian economy because all of this concert shows, artists, this is all uh, Russian business, which has uh, bloody money, as we know, and support Russian army. So this is everything which is connected, but, um, but, uh, now, going back to your uh, direct question about identity, I think that um, for me it's very intersectional and I believe that uh, we now trying to look um, on Ukrainians, as uh, Mayhill before said, in the beginning of 20th century it was this discussion about what does it mean to be Ukrainian? And it doesn't mean to be ethni uh, ethnically Ukrainian. It's being uh, uh, the Cre Ukrainian from uh, Crimea and being Tatar, uh, uh, Tatar from Crimea or being Jewish, uh, um, a part of Jewish community or being Greek. Uh, it's very um, essential work on that made by um, Odessa artist Nikolai Karabinovich, and he dedicated this work to his personal uh, family history uh, farther away or far away, it's called. And the idea is that he um, uh, filmed a small uh, video in a decent uh, landscape of Kazakhstan just to remind uh, his family history and the deportation of Greeks. 
uh, from Odessa. Um, so it's it's very complex, and I would not say um, that uh, it's something that's already uh, created. I think we're still on the process, and we're now trying to look uh, how it could be possible to include all of these uh, different uh, meanings and all of different understanding because it's not also uh, something that's uh, connected to the roots but also uh, our social identity like how we uh, understand our gender as well this is in art is present uh, very deeply and broadly and I guess uh, um, we now just really in the um, state of formation of it and it would be interesting to look uh, how it would be uh, at the end. I may add something, which, I mean, I generally agree with what Kata said already. Uh, and uh, I like your idea, of course, of not uh, referring to Russia at all and not contextualizing uh, everything uh, like uh, at the backdrop of Russian uh, culture or something like that. But um, the question, how much is it possible? Because the Russia and how much is it possible to cancel culture, Russian uh, cancel Russia or cancel Russian culture? Because somehow uh, this Russian culture is also part of Ukrainian of Ukrainian culture and social and cultural landscape, whether we want it or not. And now you can uh, observe a lot of discussions, for example, about Bulgakov Museum. Should we keep it or should we cancel it? And discussions about the Russian language. Should we speak the Russian language or should we cancel it? I mean, it's not an easy question. And that's why I'm, I'm saying that um, uh, Ukrainian society, I believe it, that now something like new, new, national, new Ukrainian identity is emerging probably. And I think it is it will be based, of course, on the choices that we made, the choices that we made during the war, the choices that we made during the Maidan revolution and so on and so on. But still, we should uh, understand. And it was very clear after the Maidan where the society united in this fight against Yanukovych, but when in this oppressive regime, but when Maidan was over and when this collective body dissolved, we discovered that people came to the Maidan for very different reasons. And then there was this famous case when uh, uh, David Chichkan made an exhibition about Maidan and this exhibition was attacked by the people who thought that it's an offensive because this very precious event belonged to all of us, but we had very different visions of that event and very different experience of that event. And the same will happen with the war, of course, because we all are struggling, we all are fighting, but. It's a question for what we are fighting. It may be very different visions of the society that we want to have. So I think what is important is to be not scared of these antagonisms that exist in society. And I think it's absolutely okay and it's absolutely healthy to have confrontations, conflicts, discussions, and antagonism. And that if you if you will be able, if you, if you, we are able to embrace it, to like to live through it and to let our openness have a completely different vision, then maybe it's already a good ground for the Ukrainian identity, which is, by the way, the colonial, because colonial identity is something that should be homogenized, right? So maybe that's that what, does, what I was trying to convey also in my presentation, that I'm trying to find this another ground for, for a community, not like some, you know, ideas of identifying with something collectively. Um, I, I would just like to add, oh, Asya. No, 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 please go for it. Um, just to completely agreeing with everything that has just been said. Um, I think the the canceling Russian culture, I think, is a is a it's an important conversation to be having, right? What is the place of of Russia, of Russian culture, of Russian language? That's an important conversation. And I think the fact that that conversation is happening and happening passionately is actually a good thing. And I think for for me, and again, I'm not Ukrainian, I'm not in Ukraine, right? I'm, I'm an outsider and I'm very aware of that, but it really is about questioning these sort of assumed hierarchies, right? Like there were these, um, about Volgakov, um, you know, there are all these lists that came out in March about, you know, the five books to read in English on Ukraine. And often those lists had Volgakov. Like, why is that, like, why is that the assumed book, right? And so I think it's good to question that. Right, and what what is our relationship with Bulgakov? Right, um, uh, you know why do why do universities always have a class on Tolstoy and Dostoevsky? To really think about that is really important, right? Why why do we have these canons? Where do they come from? Can we change them? So I think that it's um, 
it's provoking a lot of really interesting and important discussions that are also very difficult. Um, and Leslie, I just loved what you said about how we can't be afraid of antagonism and afraid of these difficult discussions. Because I think, Maria, to, to your question, one thing that, again, my observation is, is uniting a collective identity is war and the experience of having your country invaded. And, and people experience it in different ways. I mean, our panel is literally all over the world today. But this is what is uniting Ukrainians is this experience of war. And we don't yet know how that's gonna unite people, right? And, and what kind of what's gonna emerge from that. But I think sort of dealing with the reality of everyone is going through this experience in their different ways, that is gonna be something that, that creates a collective identity. Um, and sort of how that develops and the difficult conversations that emerge, you know, we'll have to see. And I hope that we're prepared. I also wanted, I have a question for Asya. Um, I really liked uh, your quote. I want to just return to it. Um, I agree with Mayhill um, how moving the quote you ended your presentation with really is about mother and the concept of you know a mother and all of the panelists today are women that's not an accident that's also a, a decentering of you know dominance of the intellectual space uh, and it's a deliberate follow-up to a lecture that we had last week by Dr. Martha Bohachevsky Homiak who wrote Feminists Despite Themselves Women in Community Life um, 18 88 to 1939 and she was a Fulbright director 2000 to 2006 and the title of her uh, lecture was why Russians are different or why Ukrainians are different from Russians again similar to what we're discussing now and one of her answers to that question was that um, Ukrainians have no gr uh, burden of greatness that's what she said, that that's actually freeing um, to not have the, the burden of greatness of the Im imperial uh, dominant mind. And she linked the history of the um, setting up of many Ukrainian studies institutions in North America to the women's movement and the important, the important place of women's history um, and in, in combating empire. So I just wanted to give Asya a chance maybe to, to tell us a little bit more about that quote and, and motherhood and the idea of the Rodina and this emphasis on, on family and hierarchy, I think is, is interesting. Um, thank you. Well, maybe I just wanted to also address the previous question because um, I think um, I mean, overall, I'm, I'm a bit critical of the concept of the identity as such and the, the the collective identity is something that would horrify me forever. Like this is this is not what I imagine as like a legitimate uh, concept. Uh, and I think because I in my presentation I was talking about the new Ukrainian subjectivity or new Ukraineness, and it is crucial that it was a new um, uh, hybrid and inclusive Ukrainas. And this is the project that I subscribe to. And when I was analyzing Maidan, and it is important to understand, and Andrew Bertnol, historian, wrote about it uh, after Maidan immediately, that uh, kind of we all know that Ukraine is a very diverse land with multiple ethnicities, cultures, etc. And he wrote that it was precisely because there was no uniform consensus on language, memory, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that was the, 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 the basis, the reason why Ukraine was so stable, like after it gained independence, because no one tried to monopolize the public sphere with saying that this is what it means to be Ukrainian or that it, what it means. So because it was like busy with all this kind of like economy, people being poor, et cetera, et cetera. But it was not an agenda to monopolize the public sphere with an idea of a uniform identity. And this is why Ukraine was stable. And when I was analyzing Maidan and like I've written about it extensively also, I was, um, for me, the concept of multitude was really important. Um, and the multitude, so because kind of, this is a very um, diverse state. So multitude is the idea that there are a plethora of individuals with various agendas, various identities, et cetera, et cetera but they 
get together when they have a particular cause that they want to fight for. And I believe, you know, and also this concept, it's Espinoza's concept and later was kind of reiterated by Hart and Negri uh, as, as, a, as a new model of resistance, resistance against global powers. So what is important for me and the country and the kind of the new, new Ukrainian, Ukrainians for which I'm kind of contributing to is the is the is like people can be whatever and they can read whatever, but there is a law, there is a particular set of values that we agree upon and that we follow. And in that regard, the canceling, uh, it is also kind of I, I fully and I was one of the those people who created the website cancel Russian culture in the early weeks of war, but at the same time, we should understand that it's not like if we speak about Russia, Ukraine, and other nation states as legal entities of subjects of international law, that it's simple. But culture operates differently, and hybridity is the very important concept. And like we cannot, it is not possible to like uh, draw a line and to say this is where like one ends and another begins. This is not how it works. And also, for example, like I'm from the I'm from Donbass, I'm from the east, and I grew up reading Russian culture, but also Ukrainian culture, literature, French, English, and also English, French, also colonial languages. And I think it is important that, or at least the project that I kind of the child that I'm trying to like uh, bear together with you is the project where we can decide individually what we read, but then we agree upon specific values and laws that we follow. And I, I think this kind of the, 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 that the subject can decide from themselves. And as Lesa said, it's okay that we are different. And as Rosie Braidotti said, the feminist scholar, she said, we are all different, but we are in this together. So I think kind of, I don't want to imagine any kind of singular form of whatever. There's like multiple things, but then we are in this together and this togetherness. And I think this is the beautiful thing that is happening in Ukraine right now. People are different. They speak different languages. My family is Russian speaking. I speak all languages, Russian, Ukrainian, whatever I did. I read different things. Uh, but the, then what kind of values we, we propose, what projects we contribute to, this is what is important. And like Russia, of course, it's not that, I just, I'll finish with that. It's not that we have to uh, situate everything against the, the kind of the, the Russia as a thing, but we should understand that there is lots of thinking, the hybrid thinking that defines many situations in Ukraine, including again, Again, the, the, the memory, the things that how we understand our values today. And it's not that we define ourselves against the colonial power. We rather try to identify what are the tropes that we inherited, that we want to take, how we can discuss them. So it is, it is a critical conversation. We don't have to pretend that it's not there. We just can take it and see where we wanna, where we wanna how we want to bring that child. So maybe that's, that's my final comment. Great, but I agree T totally. Any more questions? Any comments? Or if there are a lot of um, folks I know who have to go, just want to let everybody know it's 6.45, but <clears throat> we can continue if, if uh, people have questions and our panelists can stay with us. Um, Lon Kaufman? Yes, um, just a, a question that come to mind related to um, start with the where I would conclude. That is, if any of you have examples of very assertive propaganda, that is the use of the arts in a very positive way, uh, particularly in pub publishing. I mean, I've, I know there were some art exhibits that people had mentioned were outside of Ukraine in Western Europe, etc. And so I'd be interested, you know, if, if any of you have specific examples of that, where does that come from? Well, actually, of course, I'm teaching, talking specifically about how propaganda works. But I I think it was, I don't know how long ago, a couple of years, a year ago, that uh, Putin, I believe, took um, a replicated, created a statue to, I think it was Prince Vladimir, right? And put it up in Moscow, essentially kind of appropriating um, what Ukrainians would consider, you know, Kievan Rus is sort of our roots and it's our, it's our history. But uh, as a great example of like just walking in, right, and, and <clears throat> ripping off somebody else's uh, history and putting it up, you know, in your front yard. Um, so I, I think, uh, again, I, I think that 
maybe the rest of the world. That's a lot of these uh, examples where artists, how they're working through personally, you know, the, these issues, which I think is excellent. But another, I guess, the use of the arts would be uh, to clarify to the world about uh, where the borders are, the sovereignty, the history of sovereignty, and how, again, how Ukraine's unique, but in pushing it to information outside the borders of Ukraine. Um, and the last point of where the question comes from, I've, on many forums, I've, you know, had to respond to these questions like, well, Putin said, you know, Ukraine never had its own history, you know, it never really had its own borders, it's a borderland, it really belonged to us, you know. Um, and uh, and so I, I think, you know, that, that could be very, very helpful actually for the rest of the world in terms of understanding what's going on in Ukraine right now and how Putin is wrong in terms of his propaganda. So I guess any, any other examples, I think all four of you gave some examples of artists or theater who is kind of pushing out defining Ukrainian history distinctiveness outside of Ukraine. Are there any other examples that would come to mind? I can also start because I already find a very small but brilliant text by Katya Lesevenko. Uh, it's uh, created uh, much earlier, um, I guess, in the beginning of last year, um, and we published it in Secondary Archive Project, uh, which originally it's a project by uh, Katarzyna Kazira Foundation, but this year we launched Ukrainian um, uh, edition with the text uh, in manifestos by Ukrainian artists and text by Katya Lisevenko called Propaganda of the World of My Dreams or uh, Monumental Propaganda of the World of My Dreams. And I hope you're not, uh, you don't mind if I will read it. Um, street sections and drawings as a result of my reflections on utopia. I'm um, afraid of it by the totality and the political attitude that seems necessary for a permanent utopia. However, I found reflection on utopia in Roland Barthes writing. Uh, there it seems to be possible due to over increased differences. The number of uh, differences becomes so big that a conflict in society is impossible. Utopia can be created through a variety of visions and desires. Uh, Foucault writes about the dis disciplinary nature of creating most objects of modern architecture and space. Actions in such a space are predeterminate and irresolute and controlled. I think about the possibility of the exist existence of the public space, the one forms through join of individual actions and initiatives, and the one that permits uh, such evident or you know, which also influences the nature and form of such actions. An accident room painting was used as a weapon after the victories uh, triumphant paintings were created. They were ceremonially carried through the streets and placed in visible locations in order to inspire young men enjoying the army. Painting has since uh, then taken up ma uh, many different forms and in, of engagements. Now I want to make in my own tool uh, and language to promote the world of my dreams. So I invite anyone, everyone to join our little walk uh, through the streets in the city and add all the dreams of shared world of mine and together to shape uh, the, um, the rain part of common space. And I think, uh, which is very interesting to me that uh, you already quoted Putin and his uh, idea of non-existence Ukraine, but uh, we are all here and uh, we are all doing something. And I think that um, being presence in time and being presence in our country or like being presence in, uh, uh public discourse uh, everywhere with our dreams um, about future this is very important because um dreaming and imagining something gives us lots of possibilities to um creation new uh, ways of uh like and just to understand how we can construct our country afterwards and how we will construct our society afterwards. Of course, um, we will uh, still uh, grounded in our uh, in our law and we are uh, in 
understanding of uh, what society is, but this is uh, really important to understand what kind of future we want to have for all of us. Yeah, so. Lon, you're muted. You're still muted. Oh no, we can't hear you. Now we hear you. Yeah, I wasn't able to unmute there, sorry. But thank you, <laughs> I appreciate that. I just wanted to add uh, briefly that um, I understand your question and really, I mean, I, I felt uh, its importance because when I came to Rome to this Institute of Art History, I uh, literally like faced those questions like what is ukraine what is ukrainian art like we don't know anything about like people who are professional researchers of art history they say we know a lot of about russian culture but are there any ukrainian culture at all <laughs> is it something that existed so but i think um, like i would answer that um, this is more task uh, not for the artists but more for uh, researchers that's uh, the task to to explore it and to to tell about it because it's something that happened that we just need to bring it out you know because as katya said artist is art is maybe occupied more with you know imagining something that is still not there while researchers uh, should uh, perform this task and tell about what what was there already so yeah thank you anna taranenko Hello, um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you very much, uh, dear panelists. Thank you very much for this wonderful presentation and your insights. Uh, and um, I have a question, <clears throat> like maybe a, a little bit about the future. Um, you um, presented so well the importance and the power of art, of reflection. And I wonder, just your thoughts, your opinion on, on the future. Uh, like after Ukraine's victory, and we are certain that this victory is um, to come. Um, like, for instance, we noticed that uh, like, the, like many pictures already, many images have become the symbols of this like ongoing war and Ukraine's like resistance, like this Russian like warship, like which has become so tremendously popular. And um, like it, it is a part of culture already, right? The stamps, like numerous images. But I wonder like, what's your opinion about like um, for further Ukraine, uh, state building and this like national nation like um, consolidation processes. Uh, do you believe that um, uh, like um, any like particular art direction should be uh, like focused or any particular art cultural project um, emphasizing patriotism like targeting or for instance aimed at uh, like children, school, um, like aged children, maybe like um, like any ideas, maybe. Thank you very much. I mean, I guess I can just start. Thank you for your question. Um, I don't think anyone can read the future. Um, as someone who is a scholar of theater, um, I just want theater to be. And I and I I don't think we can prescribe what those stories should be, but we should, as I sort of gestured at the end of my talk, we have to let those stories emerge. Um, and and I hope, kind of echoing what my co-panelists have said, that they're really different and diverse and maybe even contradictory. Um, and already, I mean, in theater repertory, you know, there's been a lot of debate about a certain theater's choice to do this show or that show. And to me, again, that's really good. Those, those conversations and those debates should be there. So I don't think, I think it's, um, I can say from my research that after the Second World War in the Soviet Union, there was a great deal of prescription about what the story was and what the narrative was. And that was incredibly bad and it was traumatic. And it, Rosa Sarkisyan has this, phrase about how war stories can be bulldozers and bulldoze over people's experiences. And we don't want to do that. 
right? I think we need to listen to all the stories. And so I, um, I think that space needs to be made for those stories to emerge. I wanted to note that in all of the presentations today, past and present, um, there's also examination of institutions and institution building through art, um, sometimes violently, sometimes co-produced with artists, other times pressing artists. And Asya also mentioned, I think the most contemporary example of um, protests and the literal occupation of a public building. And as I had said, um, that there needs to be an integration into institutions with new ideas and infusion, uh, openness to, to build them and not only resist. Um, and that also is an idea um, in art history too, that carries with it a lot of controversy around uh, money, around, around art and its relation to money, to class, to currency and to the canon how art becomes valuable and is traded and is uh, purchased and sold in private galleries versus owned by the state so everyone can access it is a huge area of professionalization um, that's undergoing rapid change in Ukraine in the context of war and was already a very um, difficult process in post-revolutionary phase in the last five years. There's a lot of debate in you know um, national training of artists education from a young age and this is a great area to to get involved in um, in the rebuilding process I know there is right now an effort underway to create a, a contemporary art museum public contemporary art museum in Ukraine Mozart they're raising money <clears throat> for this already um, there's there's a lot of conversation here in, in public access and public ownership over art rather than private collections. And I follow the art critic Hito Steril, Steril, I'm not pronouncing her name very well, but she's from Berlin and she, she writes a lot about this um, relationship uh, worldwide in, co in contemporary art between um, resources and, and art and it's it's complicated. So that's one thing I wanted to also, um, it's already seven o'clock, but I did want to mention Daniel Render's comment in the chat. Um, he says, I think the decolonial movement that started in the late 2000s based on former ideas of the third world, second world should be decolonized from its vocabulary, like geopolitics, BRICS, multipolar world that has now occurred as propaganda of Russia and other similar totalitarian regimes or just to forget about this movement and start from ground zero, from the position that is based on colonial experience with Russia, which takes a huge part of global coloniality that exists through denial, uh, self-victimization and false opposition with the West. So that's um, ten, ten L's. Ten L, are you still here with us? Maybe you wanna elaborate? Hey. So, so we were reading your comment about first world, second world, third world ideas as the colonialization of vocabulary with which we talk about decolonizing. Um, so I was wondering if you had a, a specific question or, or comment for our panelists. Yeah, uh, hello, thank you for uh, everything uh, today. Uh, I, I think if uh, events like this use the word decoloniality, it also means that uh, we should think where do we take this decoloniality from? This word has a certain genealogy, and so it's a movement basically. And uh, this movement, I've been following it myself for like 10 years. Uh, I remember uh, all the vocabulary it was using. Uh, I mean, authors like uh, Walter Mignolo, Ramon Grosfogel, and, and so on. Uh, I think there is a lot uh, to reconsider right now, especially from our point of view, from from uh, Ukraine and then the Baltics and the other East European uh, positions, uh, the vocabulary which has been somehow instrumentalized, as I think, as I propose, uh, by these so-called uh, BRICS regimes. And as I remember the movement, uh, 
decoloniality, modernity, they advocated actually the ideology of BRICS and multipolar world order. So uh, it's something to, I wanted to bring up. Did anyone yeah. from from our panel want to to jump in about the maybe the global context of? Maybe I'll just quickly yeah. uh, respond, and then uh, maybe this will be the last because we are all very tired at this moment. But thank you so much, uh, Tanel, for this comment. I fully agree with you, and uh, I've written things related to that lately. Um, and for example, I I didn't use the word the colonial today because I'm very aware like where this. Um, like I would say this, like I use the word decolonial in other instances, but when I use it, then I make sure that I have this entire kind of comments on the, the, the dual colonization between uh, how Ukraine was the subject of this dual colonization from both East and West, and how Russia in particular now weaponizes uh, this vocabulary. And if we only use the decolonial as our Western colleagues use it, then we find ourselves as subjects or like instruments of that propaganda. No, I fully agree about that. And this is why today I didn't use it, but um, I think this is a very important and legitimate content, uh, uh, comment. And that now in Ukraine, because now, unfortunately, Fortunately, unfortunately, uh, we have so many tasks, you know, in addition to kind of uh, uh, to like surviving and resisting, but it's also through our case and also the case of Baltic states that never was properly articulated, but it is also our kind of job now to point at this epistemological gap that emerged because there is this decolonial theory and language. And then the, the kind of the Soviet and the Russian terror was excluded from that conversation. So what kind of vocabulary we can use now? It's, uh, yeah, it's a very important task. Okay, does anyone have last comments from our panel? Any panelists? No? All right, we thank everyone um, for your passion, your help, your assistance for Ukraine, everything you're doing um, in your communities, and most of all, um, for each other. And we thank our panelists, especially today, for sharing their expertise with us, making their knowledge uh, publicly available. And we encourage all of you to um, write to us with your ideas and to form panels for the future um, to continue this discussion. So thank you. Let's give a round of applause to our, our speakers today.